This is a very interesting audience. A convex combination includes all of science, practically. I mean, we have experimentalists, and we have uh, super experts on imaging, uh, and it's a very nice combination. But at the risk of uh, being boring to some of the experts, let me just go over a few minutes worth of imaging in general before I get to this, okay? So, what are we going to talk about? Uh, for example, denoising. And let me know if this is big enough. Or deblurring, whatever. And it's going to be a little biographical. Uh, so, about in, uh, when was it? About 1985 or 87, I was minding my business, and uh, Lenny Rudin came into my office at Rockwell Science Center and said, you do image, you do shock calculations. You resolve discontinuities. Images have discontinuities. So the stuff that's used in shock calculations should be very useful in image processing. And it was. So what that led to was, uh, if you have an image, which is a step function, and you try to recover it by Fourier series or something, you will get oscillations. I can't even do this. You get oscillations. It's the nature of the beast. If you use uh, old-fashioned methods, Fourier methods, linear methods, you get oscillations. And uh, how do you get rid of them? Well, you use something that we use in uh, uh, shock calculations, which is you minimize the integral in one dimension, for example, the integral of u sub x. This is u as a function of x. Uh, going this way. And of course, we're going to do this in multi dimensions and movies, videos, and God knows what all, but this is a simple case. And so the idea is to try to take a noisy image and recover it without losing, uh, without creating stuff like this. And you guys have lots and lots of noise. And uh, other people have come along in recent years and done very well. BM3D is Alexander Foy here, uh, the guy from Tampere. I should give him a plug. But anyway, I'm going to stick with this old stuff. Uh, so the basic idea is if you have a function u uh, and you want to m minimize the integral of u minus f squared, f is known, I hope f is, this is big enough, and you want to find u from f, which is noisy, uh, so you add a constant gamma times the integral of the, abs of the gradient of u. And one dimension is just u sub x. And what is the big deal? The big deal is it's not gradient of u squared. God forbid. That's not permitted at UCLA. Uh, it's uh, the first power. We love L1. And what this does is, of course, it makes it a more complicated nonlinear problem, but over the last 20 years, we have really fast ways of solving it. Uh, and uh, this has 18,000 citations, which we don't deserve, but anyway, there it is. Uh, and for example, we got the first picture of a black hole using the, not we, but the black hole people uh, use total variation to do this. Total variation is not the best thing. If you have a, something like this with wiggles, it has a tendency to make it steps, and you can improve it. And as I said, uh, the guys from Tampere, I think it's a whole city worth of people uh, doing de-blurring, de imaging uh, de uh, noising in Finland. Uh, but anyway, this is still a very good old time thing, and I'll talk about how to do it. The question is how big gamma is. A lot of people ask me that on Monday. And the answer is you can find the right gamma by using something called uh, Bregman iteration. Iteration, which is actually something which is a little more general. Uh, if you know about anything about this, it's ADMM. Alternating direction method of multipliers or something. And it's a nice way of proceeding. You iterate, and you finally get rid of noise for a while, and then it gets noisy again, and you stop at a certain point. And that removes the need for gamma. There's a little bit of extra work, but a lot of people ask me about gamma, so I might as well tell you about that. So this is the first kind of thing I want to talk about for imaging that's totally relevant and very well known to many people in the audience. Uh, but there's yet another thing, which is a little bit more obscure, although it has more citations. Uh, I check it every day. Okay. 
And this is related to something I was, the last speaker spoke about, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, the stuff where you have, if you have a probe in your language, uh, what, where, should, where should the holes be? That's a good question. What's a good probe? And I'll show you pictures later. So it's a question of geometry, basically. What you're trying to do is try to do good image, do get good image recovery by choosing a good shape. Now, choosing a good shape involves moving a shape around until you're close to the right answer. And we did this in inverse lithography. Lithography. And uh, later on, if anybody cares, I'll give you the paper. And in my usual modest fashion, I'll say we revolutionized this subject. What inverse lithography does is you shine, you have something over here, a given shape that you want to get. And now here is another shape, and you're, sh you're sending a signal past there. And the question is, what should a shape out here be so you get a desired shape? And there was a whole way of doing this, which was based on fiddling and fooling and doing all this kind of stuff. And what we did, which I think could be useful for what you guys are doing, getting the right shape of a probe, was use the level set method. Which I can tell you about very briefly. Uh, and then, by the way, this uh, TV stuff uh, was done with Lenny Rudin, me, and Fatimi in 1980, what the hell, 1992. We did it earlier. We tried to make money out of it before we published it. And we did. It paid for my divorce and everything. But uh, <clears throat> not enough. And this, I made no money whatsoever, even though we had a company, bad management. But it revolutionized uh, inverse lithography. And there's a paper on the UCLA website right now which describes the algorithm. We have patents and everything, but you can... So it's not the same problem. Uh, we're going to send something in here, which is a strange shape, but you solve Maxwell's equation, so whatever, it, whatever the direct problem solves, you get the desired shape. And the way you do it, and this I'll do very briefly, and now I'll have, I promise you, I'll have a real non-Blackboard talk. Okay. But very briefly, what is the level set method? I think it's good for you, people to know about it. The idea is the following. You have a shape, which is uh, a bubble in three dimensions or a curve in three space or God knows what all, and you want to move it on the grid, numerical analysis. So this is going to move with a given velocity v, and in here is the shape, and the shape could be multiply connected. And we're allowing the shape to intersect or break, or do all kinds of crazy stuff, and move with geometry. So what the, the idea is a very simple one. Uh, you have a, a function phi of x and t. x could be 16 dimensions, or much higher even, uh, in time, and here. And phi of x, t is greater than 0 in these bubbles. It's less than 0 outside. And it moves, and as it moves, it's the zero level set tells you where you are. Okay, so instead of instead of putting particles on on a shape and following it that way or something, you find the function whose level set tells you where you are, and that allows you to do intersections and breakups and all kinds of crazy stuff. And the equation is very simple: you have a velocity v, and the function phi of x t satisfies a very simple equation. Phi sub t plus v dot grad phi is equal to zero. In one dimension, it's just v times phi sub x, whatever. That's the beginning. But v could be many different things, and you can optimize this thing. And what we did in this shape optimization business was uh, f try to figure out what shape, as I said, would get the right uh, uh, shape down below. And it was totally unintuitive. Uh, so it's, if you solve Maxwell's equation, pass this, thing, pass this thing, strange things happen. There's a whole lot of stuff about this. I did this with uh, Sethian 
in 1988, and there's lots and lots of applications. The only reason I'm bringing it up here is that we might be able to use it to create good, good probes with holes in them to get, the, to get a desired reconstruction. But this is, a, this is not a trivial thing to do. It took a while for us to do it, even for lithography. But there's a paper online, which I can, se I can send anybody who's interested, in which we actually give all the details. So that's it for the preparation. Uh, so th this is uh, like a, a quick run through and stuff I'm going to use. And uh, any questions to begin with? No. Oh. OK, so let's talk about uh, variational methods for uh, uh, computational microscopy. This is mostly work done by this gentleman over here, who is Min Pham, my student, former student, and a postdoc here. OK, let's go. So we're going to talk about super resolution tychography, low dose tych oops, tychography, vector, democracy, and deconvolution with deep learning and high, performing, uh, high performance uh, computing. OK, next. Super resolution tychography. You've heard a lot about tychography uh, a couple, an hour ago. Let's go over it again. It's an inverse problem. Every, in fact, everything you guys do is an inverse problem, just about. This subject is very rich. And we have experimentalists who are also interested in doing numerical results, which is great. And uh, the problems are usually original and interesting. So uh, I'm enjoying it, actually. Anyway, tychography is an inverse problem. You reconstruct a 2D object from a set of diffraction patterns. Uh, you have the Fourier intensity of the Fourier transform. That's the square root of IN is given. And you want to minimize that quadratic error. Uh, on the Fourier side. And you have the absolute value of uh, the Fourier transform times the projection times the unknown object. And so the idea is to find the object. And this smells a little bit like what we were doing for uh, lithography, OK? Except we're not changing the shape of the probe. Uh, this is more advanced than phase retrieval. This is not a single shot. And the overlap helps. You can't reconstruct uh, Fourier frequencies from magnitudes unless you have more information. And the more information is the stuff that was discussed in the last talk, for example, this raster scan. Okay? But you definitely need uh, um, overlap. OK, this is what it looks like. You have, a, you have a pinhole, a sample, and you get a detector. And then you play. All you have is the detector and knowledge of the uh, uh, pinhole, and you want to invert this thing somehow. So you're minimizing over the, uh, the important thing is O, the object. And the object basically has some geometry, but also has a shape. Uh, so this becomes, uh, right now, it's an L2 optimization. OK, next. So we do gradient descent on P and O. Uh, and you iterate backwards and forwards backwards by missing a C, and so on. So this is, uh, in real life, actually, I think we're using primal dual uh, hybrid gradient, which is a little more complicated, interesting version of this. Uh, but this is an alternating optimization method, which is kind of standard. Uh, and it's uh, Douglas Ratchford. OK. So uh, I mean, this is what it looks like. And it's not that complicated. Next. So super resolution uh, tychography says super solution, which is even better. Uh, you have upsampling. You have regularization, which I talked about. You have this cutoff frequency. And you have a structured probe, which uh, illumination. Uh, and you can put the probe before or after the sample. OK. So this becomes a familiar problem, which smells a little bit like what I talked about in that uh, first optimization business. OK. Next. So super resolution tychography says you want to uh, determine the high frequency information of, uh, ty ty I can't even say tychography images. Uh, it's an under-constrained sy uh, system. But we have overlap scanning, so we can get high information from the images, from this uh, ty tychography images. So you need a structured probe to obtain high frequency information, a regularizer for tychography, which I love. And smaller and smaller uh, subpixel scanning step sizes, and so on. OK. 
Okay, very good, next. So there's the original optimization problem. We need a regularizer, aha, and there it is. Uh, gamma times TV, okay. And why is it TV? Well, TV, as I said before, is very good at getting edges and finding boundaries. And that's what you were looking for here, essentially. Okay, so uh, total variation is uh, a very useful thing. This helps to stabilize the reconstruction and also denoises. Uh, it's not perfect. I mean, you can, if uh, there's a lot of noise, you'll have, uh, you know, it doesn't give you back a clean image. And again, if you ever do this, uh, do me a favor and do Bregman iteration, which is not hard, it's in a paper, some papers I wrote, because uh, if you do this without iterating, you will lose uh, intensity a little bit. It depends how big gamma is. So for example, if you had a smooth function and you were doing total variation regularization on it, uh, instead of getting it back, you get a shrunk version of it. Uh, but you can get rid of that by this thing I mentioned, okay. Uh, so total variation helps to stabilize the reconstruction and to denoise. You can de-blur also uh, if you uh, if you have um, uh, instead of having uh, O n as, as the uh, as the uh, O as the unknown variable, you convolved it with something, and then you can do deconvolution, which I won't talk about. But anyway, it works pretty. Question? Yeah. So here we're going to rise on the on the object, but we're looking also for P. Does it make sense to regularize on P as well? Uh, on what? Like adding a regularization <coughs> term for P. No. P yeah. Uh, yeah, we only regularize the object because we, n we assume that the object can have a sharp X, but the prior problem not, doesn't have a sharp X. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good question. Okay, next. So this is uh, total variation, you know, alternating minimization. Uh, EPI update, I'm learning, is basically gradient descent. Uh, this is not the way we do it. But uh, we do it using uh, this fancy stuff I mentioned, uh, split pregnant or whatever. But anyway, so th this is the problem. First you apply to a TV to the, uh, looks like psycho image, Tycho image. Uh, and uh, using this, oh, now you did it right, augmented Lagrangian, sorry. Yeah, yeah. first step. First step is, uh, is exactly, that is great, that is precisely Bregman iteration or augmented Lagrangian or whatever. Uh, this subject is such that you, people keep re-deriving re, re, re old algorithms. And uh, that's what we did here, we called it Bregman iteration, but augmented Lagrangian beat us, but we used it for L1 and, and for, uh, TV. And as long as I've got you guys enthralled by optimization, let me, get, let me tell you one more thing which we're going to use before I forget, which is um, sparse recovery. Okay. And that was used beautifully by men, I'll show you later, to try to find zeros of something. Uh, the basic idea is something which was a big deal. Uh, it was done here at IPAM, physically in this building, uh, with uh, uh, Donahoe, Candez, and Terry Tao. And what they were doing was you have an equation, essentially, oops, AX equals B, and you would like to, but it's underdetermined. So there are many, many solutions. Okay, you have many solutions to AX equals B. And you want the one with the smallest X zero norm, which means the one with the fewest non-zero quantities. Okay, that's a very basic issue. You're trying to make a lot of stuff zero that you don't need uh, in order to solve uh, a problem. I mean, this comes up a lot, surprisingly, in physics. For example, getting compact support for uh, uh, eigenvalues of Schrodinger operators. I did something like that. And the way you do it, which our guys showed, which it was actually pretty well known, but they proved it rigorously, was that you'd minimize uh, the norm of AX uh, minus B squared plus something times the norm of X. And what norm is it? It's the L1 norm, summation XI, absolute value. 
not squared. So UCLA is an L1 school. We, uh, it's L1 for the gradient and L1 for the uh, function. And this was done a while ago, and it was actually literally conceived here by those three guys. And my contribution was to get a fancy algorithm to solve it. Uh, but uh, it's good stuff. And he used it very nicely, as I will show you, to find zeros, to find places where there's no material. So this can be used in physics. OK. All right, next. So we're going to solve this super resolution uh, optimization problem uh, by alternating direction method of multiplier, which is Bregman. And this yk plus 1, for those who care, that's a so-called shrink operator. Uh, what it does, and it makes it very easy to solve uh, nonlinear problems of a certain type. So if you minimize x minus y squared, now let me see, plus lambda times the L1 norm of y, 1, uh, the solution is x is equal to shrink, oops, uh, y 1 over lambda, whatever that means. It means you take y and you make it closer to 0 by 1 over lambda. That's the solution. Okay, and that's a very useful, simple algorithm, uh, which comes up a lot, and we're going to use it here eventually. Okay, so the shrink, in fact, we did use it here. Right now, the shrink operator is called is, is soft, soft threshold. Okay, very good. Next. So here are some results. There's, on the left, we have the original, which is an easy original. Uh, you use epi in the middle, and it blurs, and then you upsample. Uh, and as, as the step size decreases, the results get better. Okay, so uh, high overlap and uh, increasing uh, step size, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, decreasing step size improves the resolution. But we're not finished. Uh, I mean, you could be finished. Let's look at the next slide. Ah, uh, this is great. This, is, this really intrigues me. Uh, you have a probe on the left, and then you have a probe in the middle and on the right, and that probe, for some god reason, god knows why, was, was made this way. And it turns out, with the structured, the structured probe gives better results. Uh, now, I don't know whether the people who built it knew that was going to happen, or it just happened. Uh, but that's very intriguing. Uh, and moreover, the reconstruction is independent of how you rotate that crazy probe. Uh, so you can see the pictures that you get a much better result uh, with that uh, crazy probe. And I really want to work on this. I, mean, I think by using level set method, you can figure out what a good probe would be and a, and a feasible one. But it, it's, it requires uh, some time and effort. But it's worth thinking about. So does anybody have any idea why they selected this shape? No. OK. Very good. Next. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and the same thing with gridding uh, aperture versus circular aperture. Uh, you get uh, better results <laughs> uh, with uh, the circular guy. Uh, and they're almost the same as the real, uh, as the original, with this uh, crazy probe. So I find this extremely intriguing. Yep? On this probe with its structure, is it, is it designed? Is there some kind of mathematical you know, formulation, or is it just optimized? You know? We didn't do any. I mean, well, not we. I mean, this, this is just reporting what other people have done. And, yeah. and the probe was designed, I think, because they could build it. Okay. I don't think they knew what it was going like to happen. It has a product structure. You, know, it's, it's so much, it's you like, would think that, turn, that you know, twisting it would make it a difference, but it doesn't seem to. But uh, there's not, hasn't been enough experiments or anything. But I tell you, this is something that could be done mathematically. And we're, I mean, but it's, it's more of an effort than this other, uh, some of these uh, gradient descent type, type ideas. But it's, uh, it might be worth it. OK, next. Uh, here's a cosmic X-ray experiment, real data. Uh, crop and up sample. The top is the real diffraction pattern. 
uh, and you can improve the resolution by two, uh, crop and do up sampling. Uh, and uh, you can see the left and the right in the middle uh, by this up sampling twice, you really improve things. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's L Fourier shell. You have your own languages over here. Fourier sh shell is basically L2 error squared. But anyway, okay, next. And here's what TV re regularization does. Uh, with a circle probe on the left, you can see oscillations and uh, if you do up sampling, it gets better. And the circle probe is better than the, uh, real, the other probe. And then uh, the idea is you're supposed to see in here that there are no oscillations. Uh, and there are, and there are there's uh, artifacts over there. If you, if you look closely, you can see them. I don't know if the artifacts are a big deal for a trivial problem like this, but uh, you get rid of them uh, by using total variation. And this is a cheat because total variation loves piecewise constants. So this is, a very, this is an easy example. But nevertheless, it shows the point and the power of this thing. Okay. Very good. And how'd you choose gamma? You didn't do Bregman here. No. Okay, but you could. All right. Uh, in fact, if you measured this, I think you would find that the intensities are lower than they should be in the right because of the gamma. But it still looks good. Okay, so there's a, tra there's a trade off between denoising and high frequency information. And uh, TV is supposed to make you happy if you tailor it right. Uh, next. So we need better structured probes. That I really want to do. Uh, experiment with biological samples and continue improving algorithms. The last line is the story of my life. Uh, but uh, that's, that's the plan. Next. Okay, so in situ CDI, here we go. So we, the, the idea, I think uh, you guys did it about three years ago, uh, use dual pin, pinholes. One pinhole illuminates the biological sample with a low dose. Uh, the other pinhole illuminates a template that can use a high dose. Okay, uh, so you, when you compute the uh, result, you get the absolute value, you get the right, you get the Fourier magnitudes plus noise. Uh, so even though you use separate pinholes to scan the sample, there's the interference in the Fourier transform. The noise level is small uh, in the diffraction pattern of B. So we use that fact to try to figure out what the biological sample looks like, which has a lot of noise. Okay, next. Uh, so reconstruction is simple because the uh, noise level for the whole thing is small uh, because of B. So you do as before. And the advantage of this clever idea is the refer reference object can be reconstructed quickly with high quality, no low noise. Uh, reconstruction enables you to define, determine the reconstruction of the low dose biological sample and you have a good initialization. And be, you can initialize with uh, just B, for example. Okay, next. So here's what it looks like. Uh, you have uh, uh, a simulation of a biological sample and a noisy diffraction pattern and its reconstruction, which is uh, A and B, is uh, magnitude and phase. Uh, okay, C is a noisy diffraction pattern. And the dose for reference is what it is. And the biological sample is five orders uh, smaller. And uh, you get uh, good magnitude and phase reconstruction with this idea. Any questions? OK. All right, next. Vector tomography, which was mentioned last, uh, last uh, talk. Okay. Uh, you you want to reconstruct a 3D object from a set of 2D projections of different rotation algorithms. Uh, I'm more saying al angles. Uh, so there are basic methods. Filter back projection I wouldn't recommend. It's a very linear method. You divide by some, something which can give you horrible oscillations. Uh, or simultaneously iterative reconstruction technique, which is some, some back and forth method. But we're going to do something else next. 
Here we go again. Resire. What does Resire stand for? A, recon a real space iterative reconstruction engine for tomography. Okay. Uh, and you have the gradient. So you, you want to minimize this thing and you uh, use the gradient as well. Uh, it involves 3D write on transform, oversampling, uh, domain extension, support constraint, and positivity constraint. So once again, we have this not so involved uh, L2 plus regularization type optimization. Let's go. Uh, first, the uh, Resire first calculates the forward projections uh, using the Radon transform, and then differences between calculated and measurement projections are back projected to yield the gradient. This is, this is absolutely the nature of optimization. Uh, you can Im impose positivity and support constraints, and then the updated object is used for next iteration. So in real life, this is nothing but constrained gradient de descent is what it amounts to. And it seems to work. Let's see. Next. So reconstruction of God knows what this thing is by Resire and uh, other methods. Uh, and in the missing wedge direction, which is the second row, uh, we or they do really well. It doesn't suffer blurring, elongation, noise, and line artifacts as the other methods seem to. I mean, even though this is simple, relatively simple uh, optimization, it works well. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, vector tomography. Here's a really original idea coming up. Uh, you have a 3D magnetic texture, uh, spin en engineered magnetic materials. You image the 3D spin textures in this metal, metal artist sample using uh, Tycho tomography. And you overlay it on the nickel and silica. And silica is voids, metal ladders. How do you design the experiment? How many tilt series are required? And what's the algorithm? Uh, so be alert, a good algorithm's coming. Next. Uh, so you have a linear integral constraint. And uh, P is computed. You can use left and right uh, polarization to eliminate the dependency of the scalar part. So uh, having done that, you, you uh, uh, elim eliminate uh, that term. And you have a vector tomography minimization problem. There it is with these projections uh, on MX, uh, MY, and MZ. Uh, and uh, B is known. OK, next. Uh, so gradient descent is the first start, first attempt. Uh, so it turns out, by a little bit of Fourier analysis, you can show that you required three tilt series, one original set, one in-plane rotation, and one side rotation, but side rotation you can't do. That's what they tell me. However, keep your eye on number two, which is really a good idea, in my opinion, as I keep saying, third time I said it. The support constraint can help. Uh, 3D magnetic field only appears in the vacancy of magnetic materials. So if you can find out where there's no material, you're in business. And how do you find out where there's no material? Well, the magic of L1. It's as simple as that. And that's what we did. So next. Uh, you get these nice zeros over there. Support constraint helps the reconstruction. Magnetic field only appears in the vacancy of the materials, the space between atoms. Uh, so you can do this when you have the support constraint. And in my opinion, yep. Sorry, so you, you, um, this concept of you know, finding zeros and, and exploiting them. So one approach is with a regularizer like L1 that's baked into the algorithm that's promoting that. But, uh, but here you're using the phrase support constraint. So is it something you, you sort of discover and then enforce? No, you just, no, you just do minimize L1. Nothing special going on. These are, these are separate things. You have a support constraint, and you add an L1 term, period. I mean, yeah, you might say, why don't you just find the zeros? Well, there's noise and lots of other stuff. So this, uh, this is a way of simultaneously finding the zeros and removing other stuff. And it's not a hard thing to do. It involves this uh, so-called shrink operator. And yes, in this case, we, we do this. 
Scala Tech Tomography Reconstruction, we find a support in the Scala object. Then we use that support for uh, the vector tomography reconstruction. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, two steps. Okay. Yeah. But I can honestly say this is the first time I've seen this in, an, in uh, image processing, uh, this, this idea. Well, I know it's been done, but I, I like it. Okay. Uh, and it seems to work. Next. How do you compute the support? There it is. You use L1 minimization instead of hard thresholding or something. And one more time, if you look down below, that is uh, uh, <laughs> augmented Lagrangian. That's basically Bregman iteration. So the L1 iteration is, is easy. And each step of the, of the uh, minimization of, of uh, Y L1 plus something involving Y squared is very simple. It's just a shrink operator. Okay. Uh, how do you compute the support? You use hard, uh, let me see next, sorry, what am I saying? Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, instead of doing uh, real Bregman, uh, Min did uh, linearized ADMM, that you can linearize this method and not have to worry about inverting a nonlinear term. Uh, linearize, linearize is uh, slower and not as accurate, but it's uh, inverse is expensive. So uh, anyway. That, that's, uh, for those who care, we can show you offline. Okay, next. Yeah, almost finished, how am I doing? Okay, uh, not bad actually. Okay, so blind deconvolution with uh, CNN, uh, convolution of neural networks. Okay, this, this, is a, this is just a statement of work in progress without too many details. You have a UNet, which is a convolutional neural network that combines uh, Encoder, decoder, skip connection. I use it down sampling, up sampling. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. And the basic idea is to de blur. Okay? Uh, to de blur without knowing what the blurring kernel is. So this is blind de blurring. So the only way you can do this is you have additional information. And you have additional information. So what you do is use a, you train on uh, relevant samples and you find out what the blurring does, and then you just do it. And that's the idea. Uh, there are possible improvements on this, but anyway, this seems to work well. Uh, so let's show an example. And you also d fool around with the gradient. Uh, and the blurring is a convolution, so, uh, and so and differentiation is a convolution. These guys commute, uh, so you can use uh, derivatives in both directions uh, and to optimize using uh, the, the, uh, the gradients. Uh, and you can, get the, you can get more training data by doing this without any more sample. Uh, you learn high frequency information when you're screwing around with gra gradients. You reduce bias for sure, and you can help in the case of, sca of scarce data. So this is just a simple notion. Uh, blind deconvolution is a tough problem. And uh, in fact, it's an impossible problem without more information. But uh, more information is, is uh, what you use in AI if you can, and that's what this does. Okay, next. And there's a result, which looks a lot better on my screen than it does up there. Uh, the guy on the right, down below, the carpet has more detail. And uh, uh, the original is on the left. And it blurs in the second and the uh, UNet, which is a different method but uses UNet, uh, is uh, not as good. And uh, PNSR improves by that much. Okay, next. All right, what are we going to do next? I think we're finished actually. Uh, apply deep learning into in situ CDI, use other neural networks than CNN, such as RNN transformers. And uh, is that it? Oh no, one more thing, which all I can do is comment on is this is uh, computation. Uh, using CUDA C++ with highly parallel computing, uh, you can uh, really improve things. Uh, and, uh, on a single or multi GPU and it's MATLAB friendly. So that's just a computational statement. And I think I'm finished. And here are some references, and I can give you a whole bunch more references offline for uh, some of the basic stuff. And thank you. That's it. Thank you.